Uh, so first of all, just to sort of recap that um, conservation organisations and agencies use a whole variety of approaches to link conservation of property uh, in eight sites. And so these range from changing the behaviour of communities towards conservation through education and outreach programmes, to changing the, the practice of conservation, so involving communities in conservation through community conserved areas, CBRM and so on. And also from looking at finding alternatives to the resources that conservationists are concerned about, alternative forms of protein rather than bush meat, alternative sources of energy rather than the environment, uh, to generating benefits from those resources of concern. So payment through environmental services, and this is where tourism fits in. So it's just one of a range um, of, of strategies and specific examples of um, interventions that conservation organisations are involved in, including tourism, a job creation, um, whether that's in the formal sector or in the informal sector, income generation, um, providing primary health and family planning, providing for subsistence needs, addressing human wildlife conflict, building skills and capacity, and improving governance and empowerment. Um, ape tourism is by far the most common approach for generating financial benefits at a local level and within the remit of ape tourism you can include some of these, um, these examples, it includes job creation, it includes income generation, it can even include health and family planning. <coughs> so just very briefly, um, and for all those in Africa you'll be aware of this, but more for the benefit of the um, Asians. Just a quick overview of the nature and scale of ape tourism in Africa. Uh, there's four species of great ape in Africa, bonobos, chimpanzees, western gorillas and eastern gorillas. Uh, eastern gorillas include the mountain gorillas that are the, the um, sort of high profile tourism attraction and western gorillas uh, include the lowland western gorillas and cross river gorillas. They're distributed across 21 range states uh, and it's interesting to note that the majority of these range states uh, are not major tourism destinations. So this is a map of um, the distribution of uh, apes. You can't read the key. The pinky colour uh, is chimpanzees and gorillas. The pale green is bonobos. The pale brown is just chimpanzees and the dark green is just gorillas. Um, tourism, countries with high tourism arrivals by contrast in Africa are the Mediterranean African countries, so Morocco, Tunisia and so on, uh, and Southern African countries. Uh, Nigeria and Kenya feature in those top arrivals, um, but not to the same degree as the Mediterranean African countries and the Southern African countries. So you can see immediately that there's not an obvious overlap between the really popular tourism destinations and those countries that have got great ape populations. Nevertheless, um, apes are major tourist attractions in a, in a number of countries. Uh, they're most significant in countries with mountain gorillas, uh, specifically Rwanda and Uganda, but also DRC. But, um, possibly less so in DRC because of the problems about the conflict in the country and the sea stability of the country and the accessibility uh, of the gorillas to tourists. Uh, Rwanda and Uganda are the countries where um, gorilla tourism is most well known and where its economic impacts have been most well documented. There's been a slower development of uh, western gorilla tourism. Um, a lot of this is to do with the degree to which they can be habituated, but also to do with the um, accessibility of tourism sites. So Liz was telling me that there are only two sites with habituated western gorillas uh, in the Republic of Congo and in the Central African Republic. But there's been some interest in trying to do this in Nigeria, um, but it's something that's not yet taken off. Uh, chimpanzees, the main sites of chimpanzee tourism are Tanzania and Uganda, uh, but this is also starting up in Rwanda and in sites in Western Central Africa, so for example uh, Cote d'Ivoire 
But again, this is nothing like um, as popular or as profitable as guerrilla tourism. And bonobos, bonobos only live in DRC. Um, tourism in DRC is complicated anyway, but bonobo tourism is just starting up um, with support from African Wildlife Foundation and the Bonobo Conservation Initiative. Whether this is something that really takes off, um, we don't yet know. So the limitations um, of a African ape range states for tourism and the, and the possibilities of developing these, for developing this further in these countries. A huge issue is political stability, and um, you know this isn't just related to ape tourism, but tourism in general is renowned for being an industry which fluctuates hugely and is hugely dependent on stability, and is hugely affected by, for example, terrorist attacks, by conflict. Uh, by um, other issues. So in countries, there's a, there's a huge number of uh, African ape range states which aren't perceived to be particularly stable or to have issues, and that will be a real deterrent for international tourists. There's also an issue of transport connections, uh, destinations that you can fly to directly from the tourist originating country are far more attractive than those that you can't fly to directly. And if it's easy to get from your airport of arrival to the site where apes are, then again that increases the attractiveness of that destination. So some of these factors that um, may be deterrents to international tourists aren't necessarily deterrents for local tourists, but local tourists don't tend to have the money to spend that international tourists have. So again, when you're talking about ape tourism, and you're talking about having very small numbers of tourists, limited group sizes, then you really need to go for the high-end market and quite often you're pricing local tourists out of, the, out of the market. There's also an issue about accessibility of ape habitats and by nature, these tend to be in remote areas, in densely forested areas, and it's actually very difficult to get tourists into some of these locations. And as I mentioned before, the limited presence of habituated groups of apes. Some major impacts though, um, ape tourism has made a clear contribution to the national economy of some countries, notably Rwanda and Uganda, and it's a prominent feature of their poverty reduction strategies. And my colleagues from Rwanda and Uganda will be going to do case studies on those countries. Uh, I think it's fair to say though that the impacts, um, even if the impacts on poor countries might be significant, the impacts on poor people are possibly less clear. So specific poverty impacts, positive ones include um, employment, jobs are hugely important for poor people, small enterprise, development, revenue sharing <coughs> from park entry fees and from joint ventures with uh, tourism companies where you get a share of the bed nights. Um, and then also the provision, the sheer provision of tourism infrastructure and services, so transport links, communications and health services. These can also be extended to poor people and, and can have significant benefits. And also the maintenance of the natural resource base, which is an essential for ecotourism, is a positive uh, for poor people in, in, uh, because they rely so much on the natural resource base, but is only a positive poverty impact if you can assure access of poor people to that natural resource base. So if tourism means uh, excluding people from the area, um, in which uh, apes live uh, more than they previously would have been excluded, then you're obviously going to have a negative impact uh, on poverty there. Uh, other negative impacts are increased law enforcement, restricting their livelihoods in the short term. Um, quite often problems with how tourism benefits are distributed, so that often the uh, richer members of the community capture those benefits rather than the poorer members of the community. And increased human wildlife conflict. If apes are habituated, they are less scared of uh, humans and there's a possibility of more encroachment into agricultural lands um, and, and more problems for the poor people that live in these lands. Um, thinking about the contribution that tourism makes um, to poverty alleviation, this is a list of interventions that work for poverty drawn from experience in the develop development sector, so, so very broadly. And these focus around sort of four key areas that are considered to be essential for alleviating poverty. The first is all about building poor people's assets 
and income through employment and through their ability to generate income through services and services, but also building their non-financial assets, so increasing their access to land and resources and increasing the productivity of those resources. The second key area that's important is providing infrastructure and services that help poor people, particularly um, that reduce their risks or help mitigate the impact of risks. The third one is all about securing their safety nets, securing social safety nets, um, ensuring food security and so on. And the fourth one is about increasing the voice of poor people, so empowering them, having them have a voice within national political structures, locally, um, nationally and so on. So you can look at um, the, the kind of interventions that are associated with ape tourism and how these compare with these, um, this broader experience from the development sector. And you can see that ape tourism can, can contribute to each of these four um, areas of importance. So firstly, maintaining, restoring and enhancing poor people's natural asset base, i.e. the natural resources on which they're dependent. Generating jobs, generating revenue, supporting small enterprises. Um, for each of these areas, I won't go through the whole table for the sake of time, but you can see that uh, tourism can really play a part in contributing to each of these, so it really can make a contribution to poverty alleviation. The, there are a number of factors that, are, that affect the degree to which this contribution to, to poverty alleviation really does happen there. The first of these is the scale of poverty, uh, and I'm sure as a colleague from a random report, it's really difficult to have a meaningful impact uh, in areas where you've got huge populations of poor people. Even if one particular tourism enterprise is hugely successful, if it's surrounded by hundreds of thousands of poor people, then the per capita impact is quite limited. Uh, secondly, the commercial viability of tourism. As I've said before, many ape habitats are necessarily remote and undeveloped, and it's just not viable, so it's going to have a limited impact. And it can actually raise unrealistic expectations if poor people think, you know, they look at a success story somewhere else and think that that's replicable in their location and just don't take account of this, you know, the essential need to have a viable tourism market. The third issue is the local capacity to engage. You know, you can't just assume that poor people have free time on their hands to engage in tourism enterprises. If it conflicts with their agricultural livelihood strategies, then it's just not going to be viable for them. Apart from time, many local people lack the necessary skills to engage effectively in tourism. You often need language skills and some kind of basic training to be able to engage in tourism enterprises, and these skills are quite often lacking. And fourthly, the, the capacity of conservation organisations and tourism organisations to ensure that benefits um, do contribute to poverty alleviation, so that they're they're targeted at the poorest people. Uh, they're helping to avoid elite capture. And also the skills within these organisations, the business skills, to develop a successful tourism enterprise. You need quite serious business skills to develop any kind of enterprise, and, and quite often this is lacking amongst NGOs. There's many ways in which uh, tourism can, however, be made more pro-poor, and lots of things that tourism organisations, whether they're NGOs, tourism ministries, protected areas, whatever, can do to really try and increase the impact that they have on poor people. So the first of these is to recognise that people who live in and around tourism areas are not um, homogeneous, there are huge differences in levels of wealth, and if you really want to target if you really want to make a poverty impact, then you need to think about how to target benefits at the poorest. Uh, development experience shows that targeting women and targeting children really does make a difference. The next issue is addressing the potentially negative impacts of strictly enforced protected areas and making sure there is some kind of access to resources that poor people are dependent on. And if it really is necessary to um, keep them out of protected areas, then to ensure there's compensation for that lack of access. Uh, another point is about developing more transparent and equitable benefit sharing mechanisms and generating realistic benefits. Poor people see huge amounts of money coming into a location for, say, gorilla tourism or chimpanzee tourism, and they see only a small amount of that flowing to the local community. They need to understand why 
you know, that some of that money, that there are huge costs associated with tourism, so some of that money is going to offset that cost, and they need to understand what's the, what's the realistic level of benefits that they can expect to achieve. Uh, another strategy is to target training opportunities and employment opportunities at poorer people, rather than necessarily those that are put forward for jobs and training, which are quite often the better connected in communities. Uh, it's a simple strategy to have a policy to purposes in anything. So this can be food for lodges, guides, the use of local taxi services and so on. Buy those locally rather than buying them in the outside. And equally, uh, tourism organisations can encourage visitors to use local services. To promote, they can promote homestays, they can direct visitors towards handicrafts, outlets and towards local services such as transport. And there's another opportunity always to provide the opportunity for tourists to make philanthropic donations to local communities. Quite often just providing um, donation boxes in hotels and in protected areas uh, is a really good way and tourists like to feel that they're making a direct contribution to the people that live in and around tourist areas. So a quick summary, overall conclusions. First of all, I think it's really important to recognise there are many African ape habitats, but for most of these, tourism is not a viable <coughs> option. Uh, in locations where it is a viable option, tourism, jobs and revenue have seriously reduced poverty for some people in some places. And beyond the jobs and the money, I think it's also important to recognise these overlooked local benefits which tourism can bring, which can contribute to poverty alleviation. So conservation of the natural resource base, I think, is a key one, but also these benefits of um, extending the infrastructure that tourism brings with it to local communities. It's a really major, it can have a really major impact having better communications, better transport, better access to healthcare, because there's a nurse on site to treat tourists that can also help to um, be available to local communities. It's also important to recognise that tourism is not without its costs to local people and that these must be recognised. But finally, looking on the positive side, so much can be done to make tourism more pro poor than it currently is, and many of those things are very simple strategies that anybody can adopt. <laughs>